Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this news conference, which is uh, the Independent Sage launching their third report following the public consultation held last week. I'm Samira Ahmed. I'll be chairing the discussion. Um, we have a lot of questions to get through in not much time. So I'm going to ask everyone uh, to keep their questions concise, one per journalist, until we've got through everyone. Um, and the other thing um, I would like to emphasize is that uh, a couple of our um, experts have to leave before one o'clock so they may um, just disappear from conversation. Um, if journalists could keep their cameras um, switched off so on audio only and mute until I call on you to ask a question. Um, but I'd like to start um, by asking Sir, Dave, Sir David King to discuss the key findings of the report which is focused on whether schools should be reopening on June the 1st in England. Thank you Samira. <clears throat> so this report follows the uh, public consultation we held on the 22nd of May and essentially, I, I really want to say we found the uh, hearing very, very helpful. Uh, and so my first job is to thank all of those who submitted questions for the public consultation. Um, I, it, while I'm saying thank you, I also want to thank BMJ and Mumsnet for partnering with us for the consultation. And of course, the many expert witnesses who provided superb background and content to our report. Let me just move on to uh, the responses to the uh, public hearing. First of all, we have developed a, a risk assessment tool to help schools and families work together uh, to make return to school as safe as possible. And this really is emphasizing the importance of providing a full educational experience for children as soon as possible. This, of course, includes the many children who will not be returning to school soon. And so we're looking at alternative educational opportunities for children over the summer holidays, perhaps through a combination of online learning, summer camps, open air activities. And we just emphasize teachers cannot be the primary workforce for these activities and other options need to be sought out. These would include scout leaders, sport coaches and other roles need to be explored. We also developed the risks of reopening for children, staff and communities based on our modeling. And we've taken into account the SAGE modeling uh, that was released on 22nd of May at the same time as our public consultation. And finally, and really importantly, we emphasize the need to support black and minority ethnic and disadvantaged communities whose members are at higher risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sir David. So um, I'm going to take um, questions when I call on you. If we could start with Eleanor Busby of uh, PA, please. Uh, one question, thank you. Hi there. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I just wanted to ask, so obviously we're um, expecting a decision from the government today uh, about whether they definitely will reopen in England from Monday. Uh, if you could just kind of sum up, if possible, kind of your main concerns about if that does go ahead on Monday and what you think schools should be doing going forward, especially with uh, many different councils across the country taking different decisions. Um, thank you very much for that question. Who would like to answer that? Um, so David, would you like to uh, answer that one? I think I, I'm going to suggest Anthony uh, tries to, to pick it up. It's, it's obviously a very difficult question. We've given advice that schools shouldn't be open under various conditions. This is now asking, but what if the schools do open on Monday? OK, and, and just uh, before you speak, Professor um, Anthony Costello is Professor of Global Health and Sustainable Development at University College London, and he's a former director at the World Health Organization. Over to you. Oh, am I unmuted? No, I am. Can you hear? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we believe that the certain conditions are first that we need to know about local data in communities. We really need to know about the prevalence of infection in some way with some kind of indicator. Secondly, we are concerned about risks. The risks to children generally are very low, but there are risks that could be passed on by children to people in multi-generational households or to others. 
So that's something, and I'm sure Professor Friston will be able to talk about the way we've measured risk to children and their families. Um, and the third thing that I would mention briefly is the whole issue of find, test, trace and isolate. Um, that is only just starting up in the country, I believe, starting today. And we're aware that there are going to be a lot of hiccups with that approach. And that's another reason why we felt that delaying for a couple of weeks would not only reduce the risk, but increase the resilience of local communities because they would have a protective community shield in place based on find, test, trace and isolate. And we are a bit concerned about linking that program, which is a sort of nationally planned program to local care providers, to local schools and the like, and especially to local public health authorities. Thank you very much, Professor Costello. Um, does anyone want to add anything to that? Otherwise, I'll move on to um, our next question, which is from Shelley Phillips of the BBC. Shelley. Apologies there. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Um, so my question is, there's been a lot of discussion about regional differences in the rate of infection. Um, so I wondered what your view is on whether schools should open in hotspots later, as some people have suggested. Um, what do you think the impact of reopening schools where the rate of infection is higher will be? And are there any um, areas where you're particularly concerned about? Thank you. And do turn on your camera when you're asking a question, because it's great to see you. Um, who would like to answer that question? Um, right. Um, that's uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Susan Mickey, who's Professor of Health Psychology and Director of the Centre for Behaviour Change at University uh, College London and a member, of course, of one of the SAGE subcommittees. Over to you. It was actually Alison Pollock. Who oh, was it was Alison Pollock. Yeah. Sorry, right. I've done another introduction, just so everyone knows. Um, <laughs> forgive me, I wasn't um, reading my labels properly. Professor Alison Pollock is co-director of the Newcastle University Centre for Excellence in Regulatory Medicine. Over to you. So here we're coming back to what do we know at local level? And the big problem that we have is that we really don't know about what the prevalence of infection is in local communities because the government hasn't been collecting these data in real time. We know a little bit from hospital admissions and a bit from deaths, but we don't know about, that's the tip of the iceberg, but we don't know what's going on locally. So that's one really important factor you have to take into account is what's actually going on locally in the local area. But the other factors that you need to take account of is the actual community um, and the risk factors in schools and in the community. So you're going to have to think about, uh, are the, have the schools got a high proportion, are they in very deprived areas with a high proportion of black and ethnic minority groups as well? Um, and what is the capacity of the school to be able to put in the measures that are being advocated by the WAO, UNICEF and others around making sure that you can have um, good small class sizes, good social distancing and make all the accommodations for schools that you need. So you need quite a lot of information and that needs to be held locally as well as nationally and resources need to go and flow from the centre locally to help support schools and the public health response. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zubeda Huck, Interim Director of the Runnymede Trust. I want to echo what Alison said, that, that, um, that we need that local response, we need that local consultation, we need to see what the local cases are. You're absolutely right, there are hotspots in the area. But the other issue that hasn't been mentioned at all by this government is that a third of the pupils in primary schools and almost a third of the pupils in secondary schools are from black and ethnic minority areas. Now we know that particular black and ethnic minority groups, namely black groups, Bangladeshi and Pakistani groups, have a much higher rate of risk of death from COVID-19. So parents will be really concerned. And that has to be taken into account because without, without as, as Anthony has mentioned, without the tests tracing and isolation and isolating the virus in place without that program in place we can't protect we can't guarantee that we'll be able to protect vulnerable people and we need to be able to protect those vulnerable groups in particular 
Um, thank you so much. Um, can I ask, um, with each of our journalists, do turn on your cameras uh, when you ask your question. We'd like to see you and say hello. Um, our next question is from Andrew Jack of the Financial Times. Hello, Andrew. Sorry, apologies. I didn't actually. Not, I didn't actually put my hand up, but I'm happy to happy to ask. I mean, I'd just like to sort of. Um, do you, have you got any sense then, in terms of a message ahead of the Prime Minister's press conference today? Are you saying very clearly that no school should be reopening on June the what? June the first. Um, um. So, David, did you want to answer that? Well, just just very quickly, um, because we have set out the conditions that Anthony Costello was uh, was listing a moment ago, which includes in particular having the test, the trace and isolate ability fully operational. Fully operational doesn't mean we promise it'll be ready on Monday, therefore schools should go back on Monday. That means we want to see it operationally tested for at least a couple of weeks. Uh, I, there is a second factor, and I think this is critically important. We know that the, the R factor for the disease across the country is between 0.7 and 0.9. It's quite close to one. If it goes above one, we're back into exponential growth of this uh, epidemic. And we also know from the calculations published by SAGE that opening up the schools has the potential to raise the R factor by up to 0.3. So we, we are really concerned that the level of infectivity across the country as a whole is too high at the moment to open the schools and even leaving it for a, a couple of weeks would reduce the onset of the disease in the country by probably a factor of two from opening the, uh, the schools up. So we've got, we've got several very important reasons for suggesting that this is just too early. Thank you. Um, Dr. Zubeda Huck. Um, I just want to add that it's not just about getting schools ready and what's happening inside of schools. One of the main issues that we've raised is that even if some children go to school, you've got a huge cohort of groups, you know, several year groups who are not going to go to school. And there is an important question about what happens to those children who are not going to school. So as we've mentioned before, um, one of the key recommendations that we make, uh, or a couple of the key recommendations that we make is one, that um, out of school provision needs to be increased. We need to be creative about using um, private private land, using football stadiums, using private school fields, um, basically non-school venues to also think about how we can get more education, how we can get other activities for those children who are not in school. And that's critical because the message that just schools are opening for some year groups is not a huge deal of comfort for all the other year groups. And we have to think about the psychological impact, the educational gap and other considerations as well. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kamlesh Kunti, who's Professor of Primary Care, uh, Diabetes and Vascular Medicine at the University of Leicester. <laughs> I think what needs to happen is a balance between the educational needs and the risk of infection, and that re balance is quite fine. Um, there may be some schools that are ready to open uh, on the 1st of June. However, speaking to colleagues within schools uh, in inner city areas, they certainly are not ready as yet. They also have the concerns that have been mentioned because these are in deprived areas and in, with a high proportion of black minority ethnic health teachers and students uh, where the risks is much higher. And that's why we've got a framework, a risk assessment framework, that if uh, schools feel they're ready, then they must meet some of all or some of these criteria. And, and the framework is quite simple. Uh, it's looking at the school assessment, assessment of the teachers and the staff, assessment of the students themselves, and the family and care assessment. I think if schools are ready and they can meet these uh, criteria, then there's by all means, uh, and the, uh, also the test, uh, trace and uh, isolate uh, facilities are available. There's no reasons why schools can't start early. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, question I'd like to take is from Rosemary Bennett. Sorry, um, Ned Simons of the Huffington Post, if you're there and if you could switch your camera on.
And if not, um, we'll take Rosemary Bennett of the Times if you're there. Hi, can Hi. you? Oh, my video. The host has disabled my video. Fine, okay. you go ahead. We can hear you. I Thank won't you. take it personally. Um, uh, can I ask um, two things, actually? Um, you suggested in your invite this morning that the government's, regardless of what you say, the government's own advice uh, from stage that we got on Friday actually suggests schools shouldn't be opening in this way on June the 1st. Could you just give me a couple of examples of uh, uh, points within the government's own stage advice uh, that give you particular concern? And my sort of number two question is, obviously many more variables come into play uh, with, with schools reopening, not least whether other aspects of restrictions will be adhered to next month. Um, if it isn't, if it if it does turn out that it has been reckless to open schools, at what point would we be able to see that in figures? What figures would that show up in? Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if I wanted to take one first. So one is um, specific concerns in the sage advice. That the government seems to be using for their decision making and the other is when would we see an impact potentially in infection rates if schools are being opened too soon who's going to uh right i i can i can start um, i can't answer that question for Go me. Ahead. I'm, I'm sorry but um I can certainly start in terms of the fact that the government, I think, um, they asked, they took uh, seven, seven to nine um, models from the DfE, which um, which they analysed. But I think one of our concerns was the, that the actual plan that the government has gone forward with ha isn't necessarily drawn from any of those models that were analysed. One of the key recommendations that SAGE made was that we should have rotating weeks and rotating year groups rather than all to, to, rather than particular year groups going back all at once and that it should be staggered in that way and rotated in that way and the government has ignored that advice and it's not clear why um, it's also not clear why they have chosen the uh, model that they have gone with which isn't a model uh, which isn't a model that's been modeled for if you don't mind me um, saying that twice uh, and, and I think that's a huge concern the difference between us and them is that um, is that Carl Friston, Professor Carl Friston, did model um, did model our path, did look at the risk with real time data. I think there's another question as uh, there's another question that arises as to how old is the data that the government um, that that the that Sage Group modelled on. You know, was that real time data? Was that a week ago? two weeks ago we certainly modeled it on real-time data so there are concerns like that or anomalies like okay. that which, um, um, thank you I think I, it would be good then to bring Professor Carl Friston who's a um, computational modeler a neuroscientist at UCL um, and in charge of developing a, ge a generative um, SEIR COVID-19 model thank you well just to uh, continue um, on Zaveda's point and actually pick up on the second question which I think is an excellent question what, how would we measure the consequences of prematurely opening schools and what's the time course of that measurement? So that's actually quite um, easy to answer. Um, roughly the time constants depend upon the duration with, with, with which you have um, an infection, the probability of transmitting it to somebody else. And very roughly you can think of this in terms of things unfolding over weeks. So on the basis of the simulations that, that we've done, it looks as though the levels of infection would fall by about a half every month or every few weeks. And that's um, relevant in terms of when would we know that we have made a mistake? And perhaps I'll just qualify that by saying we should be the local region, the local community. So you know, referring back to some previous questions, um, highlighting that the answers are going to be very particular, very specific to each region. But the answers do have a generic aspect to them um, that you will only know if you've made a mistake in your region several weeks, if not months, after you have made that mistake. So 
that's important to know. It speaks to actually going and looking at the experiences of other countries who have entered this game before we have and using those real-time data to answer questions, very pertinent questions, what are the relative risks of this and that? The impression so far, uh, and this is still early days, the impression so far is that the risk to us as a population may be quite low in the sense that the mechanisms that are going to inflate R are much longer term and will evolve over months, again, looking at a second wave probably even after Christmas. So the short-term risks for the population are possibly lower than people might imagine. However, the risks to your family, say you had somebody at home that you were shielding, then there is a tangible change in the relative risk of exposing your loved one at home should you send your child to school and that child brings an infection home. Thank so you. quantitatively speaking, then this time course, this decay, this attenuation of the virus in the classroom really makes a difference. It can change the probability of your child bringing the virus into your home by a factor of two if you just deferred for two weeks. Uh, so thank the, you. Yeah. Sorry, did you want to just finish your point? I'm just conscious of other people wanted to add. I, yeah, I, I will finish the point. I, I just think the modelling and, and the questions really gives licence to people to defer should they think it is necessary in their local area. So it's really you're giving them, if you like, a, a motivation to think carefully about what they should do in their situation. Thank you. Uh, two more um, members of, of Independent Asia wanted to contribute. So can I take Professor uh, Gabriel Scali next, Pref President of Epidemiology and Public Health Section at the Royal Society of Medicine. One of the things that we noted in our report was the official SAGE recommendation that there must be strong intersectoral partnerships in place with local champions and coordinators of testing to support schools reopening safely. And I think there's no evidence that those uh, partnerships are in place. Uh, and in fact, there's very good reasons to believe that there are serious problems with communication. Uh, it hasn't received as much publicity as I thought perhaps it would, but uh, I don't live very far from Western Supermare and the hospital uh, they're closed within the, to new admissions within the last few days. And there have been 60 cases amongst patients uh, of infection and of the staff that have been tested recently, 40% have been found to be positive. So there's a very substantial outbreak going on there. And the local authority is complaining very bitterly about the complete lack of communication from the NHS to the local authority. And that's the sort of partnership that we cannot afford not to, uh, to have in place. It must be in place. The local authorities must know what's going on in their local area with infection and the NHS must know what's going on and be very open about it. So I, I think official SAGE's recommendation certainly hasn't been met and we certainly wouldn't be uh, advocating uh, the reopening of schools until that test and trace mechanism is in place and seen to be operating effectively. Thank you so much. I know Professor Susan Mickey, you wanted to speak and just because you didn't speak last time, I introduce you, you're Professor of Health Psychology and Director of the Centre for Behavioural Change at University College London. Um, thank you. Uh, part of the second question was raising the issue about the context within which schools are opening and of course schools are not opening in a vacuum. Um, and there are other easing of restrictions um, that are being mooted that we will hear about in the coming days. And obviously all easing of restrictions um, means there's the potential for more human to human, household to household and community to community transmission. And we also have a situation in which, um, according to opinion polls, um, some people may, who before would have been adhering to guidelines, may not be. So we are in a risky situation. And what this means is that we need to ensure that the messages get out very, very strongly as these uh, restrictions are getting eased, that people absolutely must uh, really respect the social distancing, Everything needs to be put into place. It's not just about uh, telling people or persuading people. It's about actually changing the environment uh, to support that. And also people absolutely have to pay attention to the personal protective behaviours of very regular hand hygiene and using tissues for sneezing or coughing, disposing of them immediately. These seem like small behaviours, but these are the behaviours that actually block transmission uh, between person 
and person. And um, as schools are being opened, um, these need to have a, a lot of attention uh, paid to them. And indeed, they're excellent um, arenas for training children uh, in these kind of skills, because um, just telling people that they should do this does not mean that we will get the population wide change in these behaviours that's required to suppress the pandem pandemic as soon as possible. I'm, I'm just conscious, um, uh, Professor Costello, that we've got quite a lot of questions to get through. So do you feel you want to add or can it wait? And there's just one thing I'd like to flag up because it's come out implicit in all the questions asked so far. One is there's a lot of um, um, things being said by uh, you members of Independent Sage about the need for local decision making. How far is that decision making possible in current situations? I mean, it's all very well saying they need to do it. And also, given that we know there's concerns about lockdown being less strictly observed, we've seen the crowds at beaches. What impact do you think that might have on any decision to open schools already? Uh, Professor Alison Pollock. Well, one of the issues that we highlight in our report is the way in which the structures and systems for local decision making have been eroded. We highlighted this in our last report for public health and contact tracing. But one of the other features, particularly for England, not Wales or Scotland, which still have a comprehensive school education under the control of local authorities, is that local authorities really have no jurisdiction over most of the schools. 77% of the secondary schools are academy schools. And I think the figure was around 33% for primary schools. So this is clearly an issue for the local community and local working. And it's really important that academy schools, which are largely autonomous, can actually work much more closely with local authorities and perhaps more control given to local authorities in the decision making. A second aspect that we highlighted was the problem of PFI schools, where the contracts are very rigid and schools can't be used out in weekends or out of term time or out of even school hours without contract negotiations. And this is really important when we're thinking about summer camps, extended school learning, educational experiences, that these contracts really will need to be opened up uh, by the Treasury and renegotiated so that the debts don't fall on the local authorities who are very hard pressed. So these are issues that we have raised in our report. Okay, um, I'm conscious that I want you to take the next questions and move on. So um, we have Josh White from the Daily Mail. If you'd like to turn on your video, if you can. And uh, one question, please. Thank you. And if Josh isn't there, forgive if you are, just start speaking and I'll stop. Um, we have, um, can I go on to um, Elizabeth Glinker from the BBC? Uh, right, well, I've definitely got Alexandra Thompson from Yahoo. Alexandra. Yes, hello. Hello. I'm trying to do my video, we'll see. There we go. Um, You've mentioned you're concerned about deprived communities and, and ethnic minority groups. Lots of children are doing virtual classes, which is all very well and good if you can afford internet and laptops, but deprived children may be falling behind and it could be widening that chasm. Are you not concerned schools need to get back? Otherwise, deprived children is going to fall further and further behind. It, it's widening that. Um, huge concern for many people about the impact on, on children falling behind. Thank you for that question. Um, Dr. Zubeda Huck. We're, we're very concerned about that, but I don't think the choice is either going to school or not having school or learning at all. And that's why we talked about out of school provision, because the reality is, is not everybody is going to go back to school in the summer, no matter what happens, no matter when school opens. So it's a really key question to think about right now, while you're thinking about whether school opens next week um, or not, what, what extra provision can we provide out of school for all children? Now, given the risks, given the risks of, uh, for ethnic minorities, for, ch for children in deprived areas, the fact that we know that deprived areas have twice the risk of, of um, death from COVID-19, I think as we, as we have been saying, we need to have the right infrastructure in place, the right test tracing and 
isolating programs in place first. But as we keep emphasizing, the government needs to think much more about out of school provision. They need to be using, we know that we know that if children are outside, we know that being outside and having more ventilation reduces the risk of infection from COVID-19. So there are possibilities. We need to be imaginative and we need to use the resources outside of school. Thank you. Um, I take, thank you very much for your question, Alexandra. Um, come and I asked Zoe Tidman from The Independent if you'd like to ask your question and if you have a camera do switch it on for us if you'd like. Okay um, I'm not sure if my camera's working. Uh, Don't worry do go ahead with your question. Okay sorry I didn't have one planned I've stood in for um, another journalist can I come back to you? Absolutely. All right thanks. To some extent, I'm working through a, a list that we have. Otherwise, I have got a lot of follow-ups that I'd like to ask. Is Hannah Devlin from The Guardian here? Would you like to ask a question? Uh, right. Uh, who else have I got on the list? David Allen from the BMJ. Uh, right. I think I did this a system where Zach, uh, the producer, you could maybe flag up who's ready to ask a question. Um, can I can I just um, follow up some of the some of the concerns I think people have had is if they've been following um, Independent Sage um, advice is again this emphasis on what the government should be doing, which is a whole new set of demands, particularly about regional um, decision making. And as I've heard in some of the answers given so far that mechanism doesn't exist given where we are given how much is going on realistically what are your thoughts about how the government could achieve some of what you're talking about in terms of regional devolution on on getting um these measures in place for schools to safely be able to consider reopening um so, so, uh, professor gabriel scally first well, that's a good question, Samira. I was a regional director of public health and I was based for a long time in the government office for the region, but regional health bodies and the regional government offices uh, disappeared post 2010. So there isn't really a regional structure there. What we do have are uh, local authorities, of course, and particularly the top tier local authorities who are, are, are despite their uh, poor financial situation in recent years are still extraordinarily important bodies and do cooperate together uh, and we have uh, elected mayors and conurbations uh, such as Merseyside and, and Greater Manchester. And I think it should be possible for the government to identify uh, regional structures and groupings uh, that resources can be invested in to build up their coordinating capacity uh, across the region. Uh, and I think because I do think the government needs to narrow the distance between Whitehall and people on the ground and local authorities are a very, very important component of that and the abil and enhanced ability for local authorities to cooperate together and for where there are elected mayors across uh, uh, significant territories, uh, for those mayors to uh, act as a coordinating force for those local authorities and giving them the power and responsibility and the resources uh, to produce a coordinated approach within those territories. I think that's extremely important. And of course, the devolved administrations have a, a substantial role to play. And they have, uh, I, I, I have been personally been critical of uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland taking a hands off approach uh, up until now. And I think there is now uh, good evidence of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland uh, taking more responsibility for determining strategy and policy locally. And I think that's good. And I would like to see the regions of England adopting similar uh, uh, approaches. Thank you. Um, Professor Anthony Costello next. Just two quick points. One is on the test, you know, find, test, trace, isolate. If this is going to work, okay, we've got enough tests, we may have enough contact tracing, but it's not going to work effectively unless you involve local public health and local primary care. Because people, when they get test results back positive, need reassurance, they need somebody to call them and recall them, to monitor them, to refer them if necessary, to understand underlying conditions. This has all got to be joined up. And I get the impression there are some pilots going on in the Midlands right now to do much more of this. 
And I got the impression from the press briefing last night that Dido Harding realizes that this has got to be introduced much more. So we, we have to monitor that process. Just one other thing on local authority engagement. We refer briefly in the report to hidden hunger, which is children going hungry because parents are going hungry. And this is a much bigger problem than people want to admit to. And the UN rapporteur, Philip Austin, raised this a year ago in his report. And that requires us to know about local data on food banks, on numbers of deprived children, people in benefits, and teachers are often the best people that know about this. So I think we need to be really sensitive to that and local authorities need to step up to the plate and try and uh, mitigate that because there may be a lot of children, look at the food queues in America. Well, that's happening in Britain. It doesn't get publicized quite as much. And I think we need to know exactly how many children are hungry because if you're hungry, you don't learn. Um, Professor Martin uh, McKeenex is Professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to obviously like to echo what Gabriel has said. Wearing another hat, we've been looking at this, and I realise this is straying a little bit beyond the science, but there is a clear problem in terms of governance and fragmentation. And I, I think in the absence of any coordinated activity from central government in, in England, I think we do need to look to local authorities to come together in regional groupings. And we have a very strong analogy here, what's happening in the United States with the vacuum that's being created by the federal government, where groups of states in the Midwest, in the West, and in New England have come together into groupings that are informal or to some degree formal uh, to collaborate because it definitely does need that connection and we also really do need a commitment by central government to talk to these bodies because we've had rather too many examples of where the mayors of Manchester and the West Midlands and elsewhere have said that they're actually not being communicated with but I, I recognise this goes beyond the strict remit of our report here. Fantastic. We've got actually three questions lined up, so forgive me. Um, I'd like to move on to make sure that we take them all. Uh, can I ask Catherine um, Luff of the Times Educational Supplement if you'd like to ask your question? And if you have a camera, do feel free to turn it on. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm not sure my camera is uh, is working either, but um, I, I wanted to ask, um, Anthony Costello, you talked a little bit about um, the hiccups that might occur with testing and tracing and that being a reason for delay. And I just wanted to ask what, what exactly you, you meant by that. Well, well, I, th I think there are two things. There's the issue of speed and there's the issue of trust. Firstly, you've got to get test results back to people quickly. And it, I don't think it's, it's good putting it all onto patients saying, well, go off and find a test. You know, the best person to organize a test for you is your GP or if you email them or, or ring them. So that needs to be sorted out because at the moment, I'm not sure that many GPs can do that. Uh, and because this is, a, a, you know, it's about integrated local sustainable primary care you're worried about your symptoms you're worried if you get a positive test you think you might be in hospital in intensive care in a week's time you need to be followed up and so the speed of getting test results back to people and linking them into primary care is a fundamental part if you just get rung up by some person who's been trained for a few hours from a call center you know 200 miles away uh, are you going to isolate for 14 days? Your GP will know about you, your circumstances, and will know many of your close contacts. If it comes from him or her, it's more likely that you're going to comply with that kind of thing. So it's getting these the speed and the trust issues linked up. And, and I think that is going to take a couple of weeks at least to, to get established. Um, Professor Susan Mickey, and then I'd like to take our next question from ITV News. There's also the issue of uh, financial insecurity, uh, because uh, for many people, um, switching from the income they're on to statutory sickness pay for 14 days, possibly several times over, uh, will not be an option for them. Uh, so there's no financial uh, compensation for that. And indeed, for them reporting contacts, they are also putting uh, possibly friends and families into a similar situation of being financially punished 
uh, by taking this very responsible public health measure. And I don't think this has been uh, thought through. And I think this raises a, another whole area of concern um, that may explain why uptake uh, may not be as um, high as we would hope it would be. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Peter Byrne. Forgive me if I've mispronounced your last name, who's from ITV News Central. Hello, Peter. Hello, it's Peter Byrne. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, you say in your report that uh, you believe in two weeks time, June the 15th, uh, the risk of infection would be halved and that the risk would be lesser still in September. Having concluded that June the 1st is too, op too early to reopen, do you have a date in mind when you think it may be safe? Uh, or if not, um, what are the factors that we think would make it the right time to reopen? Um, who would like to take that one? Um, Dr. Zubeda Huck first, yes. And then Carl Friston. I'm, I'm hoping, yes, Carl, <laughs> Carl will back me up. Um, I don't think it's a question of, is the question shouldn't be, is school safe to open? The question should be, when are schools safe enough to open? Um, one of the things that we emphasise in our report is that, you know, it's not that there is no risk at all. It's, it's all relative. So the risk of, of staying at home is less than going to school and the risk is um, less, in, you know, on the 15th of June than it is on the 1st in September and, you know, before... June. So it, it, it's all relative. I mean, what we do emphasize is the risk to children is very small regardless. But as Susan and others have, have pointed out, it's not just, you know, schools don't operate in a vacuum, that they, they, they are embedded in communities. And we have to think about the impact on teachers on support staff as, as well as grandparents. So I think that's the most important thing we need to think about. But I'm sure Carl can thank help you. me out with this yes. one. Professor Carl Friston. Oh, no, I, I, I'm delighted to back you up. That was <laughs> um, so the whole point of this modelling really is is not to provide rules. It's to provide a quantitative assessment of the relative risk so you can make your own mind up. You know, so, for example, if I didn't have an elderly person or a grandparent in my house, I'd be quite happy accepting the risk of four times being killed in a road traffic accident today on sending my child back to school on the 1st of June. If, on the other hand, I had a grandparent in the, in the home, that would be a little bit too high. I'd want to wait just a couple of weeks until it halved. And then you know, you're in the noise, effectively. So that's that's how I would use that particular risk. I, again, coming back um, to Samira's point, that 1st of June, every, every region, every school will have its own 1st of June. Some 1st of Junes will actually be on the 1st of June. There'll be other parts of the country where the 1st of June is about three weeks' time. So that's why we need this sort of local, informed, quantitative assessment of the levels of, in, of uh, the prevalence of infection. That is easy to do. Um, you know, the, the math, the science is there. It just requires the data <laughs> to upper uh, tier authority level to be fed to the local authorities so they can make their own minds up and talk to their to their teachers. Um, there's a chance for any further questions from journalists if you want to um, either message them on the chat or um, let the producer know. Um, I just want to ask um, Independent Sage, there's a real sense in the public mood now of a kind of unravelling going on and how people feel others are obeying um, lockdown and, and, and anxiety because of some of the issues that you've raised, others have raised about whether or not um, the systems being rolled out are being rolled out because they're ready or, or whether there's some kind of public um, agenda, a sort of public relations agenda to make it seem. What would you say for those who are really concerned they're not sure what's safe anymore and they're concerned that the lockdown and all the the gradual lifting of it is unraveling um without control yes uh professor mickey first um in a way the lockdown was much uh, more straightforward because um <clears throat> the same thing was being applied to everyone and it was always going to be more complicated uh easing the restrictions because um different things will be happening to different parts of the workforce and different parts of the population. Um, one of the things that has, has um, helped this pandemic not be even worse than it's been for us is the collective solidarity that developed uh, within communities um, 
really uh, looking after each other, really supporting each other to abide um, incredibly well to quite challenging um, guidelines in a lot of instances. And what's absolutely key going forward is that despite things um, getting a bit knocked off track in different ways, that the British people have showed so much responsibility, so much care for each other and so much intelligence carries on understanding the significance of why these um, rules are in place and that we're doing it for ourselves, we're doing it for our communities, we're doing it for our loved ones. And together we can um, make this, suppress this pandemic as soon as possible. So I think it's that sense uh, that's so key in going forward. Um, and yes, there will be local outbreaks and there will be uh, challenges to deal with. But the important thing is that we pay attention overwhelmingly to the um, health crisis, the public health crisis, and not get distract distracted um, by political crises. Thank you. Uh, Professor Alison Pollock, and then I'd like to take a final question, please. Yes. Thanks. Well, I completely agree with Susan. Um, the public have been absolutely amazing. And that's really reflected in what's been happening in terms of the epidemic um, uh, and the prevalence. Um, so um, the public have shown great trust in each other and social solidarity. However, I think the real issue now is about government responsibilities to us. And that's really important. And our, both our reports have highly lighted major lacunae, both in local authorities and in public health, and the governance of schools as well, because of disinvestment, because the structures aren't there, and the urgent need to rebuild capacity and reinvest in the systems that once protected local communities. And this is really urgent that this is done because without it, we can't get on top of our local epidemics and have proper community responses. And that's really why the, uh, the public need to feel confident that the government really is acting in their best interest and doing the things that we're advocating and highlighting as issues in our reports. Uh, just before I call on Alexandra Thompson, um, I think people watching might also be wondering, the big question is why you think the government is ignoring its own advice and why um, Witty and Valance in particular, um, you know, have stopped appearing. Um, uh, Prof uh, Professor Susan Mickey. Um, well, one thing I think is um, very important going forward is that um, scientific trust isn't dented at all because science is, and, and medical advances is what will get us out of this. And so the scientific and medical leadership um, and respect is paramount. And I think going forward, it would be extremely helpful if our chief medical officer and chief scientific advisor were to give um, direct press briefings and direct briefings to the public to report on uh, the scientific thinking of SAGE um, out with any political context um, that I think hasn't been helpful and I think is being increasingly unhelpful. Um, I know Alexandra Thompson from Yahoo had one more question and um, I'd like it to be now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just following up from what I asked earlier. Um, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Huck, you mentioned sort of getting creative and outdoor space has a much lower risk of transmission. Just to make sure I understand you, are you suggesting sort of outdoor classrooms and, and how realistic is that as the weather eventually gets cooler? Oh, yes. I mean, we think summer is a good time to do it. You know, we've had glorious weather. There's no reason why you can't have outdoor classrooms under marquees in different kinds of buildings, in sports facilities and so on. Um, I mean, the reality is, is, with social distancing measures, you're only going to be able to have half the children in schools anyway because of the social distancing measures. So what about the other half? What about all those that are at home? I think the issue around the social psychological aspect of school is very important. So that's yet another reason to have, you know, out of school provision. Um, but once again, it does go back. It does go back to the issue of the school workforce and how that needs to be expanded. Okay. I can see my colleague Gabriel has yeah. something to say on um, this. Yes, uh, Dr. Gabriel, uh, Professor Gabriel Scali, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. There's a very long-standing tradition of the use of outdoor schools. 
uh, in improving the health of children in this country. It only really ended in the late 1950s. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity to reinvent some of that, particularly given uh, we're going into the summer months. Uh, there will be a lot of marquees and temporary buildings which won't be being used for other things, whether they be uh, social events or weddings or whatever. Uh, and uh, it's an opportunity to have uh, children in a healthier environment, not just because it uh, stops the virus spreading quite as easily, but also we know about the therapeutic benefit of being in green space and, uh, uh, and a physical activity. So there is a real opportunity to be inventive and take our schools out of doors, uh, take over some green space, take over temporary buildings, and uh, really having something enjoyable and something that will make for a memorable educational and uh, social experience for our, our children uh, coming out of this very difficult time. Will you forgive me, um, Dr. Hatt? It's just that we're, we're running quite late. Unless it's a brief comment. Oh, but yes, very quickly. I mean, Alexandra and, and actually um, everyone else, you might find it quite useful to. Ah, look at our um, Q&A section, which is based entirely on questions from the public, teachers, parents, you know, other professionals about how can you, you know, about these issues, because the public have been thinking about these issues. The government may not have, but the public have. Sorry, I, it froze on my screen, may froze for others for a couple of seconds. Where is this Q&A? This is in the independent oh, sorry, report. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I haven't got a great internet. The, the, the Q&A from the public is at the, at the back of the report. Report, okay. Um, and there's, couple of, there's lots of questions that we've picked from the public Fantastic. and we try and answer it. And that's one of them, Alexandra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Thank you to everyone who's asked questions. Thank you so much to um, all the panel members. Can I hand back to David King then just to uh, wrap things up for this news conference? Are you on yeah. mute still? All I'm going to do is say thank you to this uh, wonderful team who have worked amazingly hard. Uh, I, I'm really incredibly grateful to them. Uh, you will see from their answers that they're all on top of the whole issue, all burning with answers to, to give you. And uh, I, I'm happy to sit back and listen and learn from them. So simply, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.